Good morning. Well, good evening. <laughs> uh, we're recording in the morning, but good evening. Uh, supposedly it's Thursday evening at 6.30 by the time you're seeing this. Welcome to session three of our Bible study, No Greater Love, a biblical walk through Christ's passion. If you were with us the first two sessions, well, this is going to be a little different. I wish I had you here with me in room three, but... Um, We'll look forward to doing this again live after this is all over with. So, in the meantime, welcome to our virtual study. Uh, we'll begin as we usually do with a prayer. So, in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit, Amen. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to study your Word and to learn from you through your Word. Give us insight and wisdom the knowledge we need to change our lives because of what we learn. Lord, we know this is a difficult time, trying time, that we're closed up in our homes and, and away from our friends and family members. We ask, Lord, that you fill us with your love and charity and give us what we need, the grace we need to make it through to the other end of this. And we will make it through to the other side. And we ask this all in your name. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, to, uh, to do this session, Ada is our uh, resident expert on all things technical, so I'm going to ask her to come up and give you some information on, uh, on how this is going to work. Ada. Hello. By this time tomorrow evening, you will have your email with your instructions, which will be a step-by-step -step video, as well as uh, information on your attached to it. You'll have your No Greater Love questionnaire and the outline. The outline of the session, but you will have the step-by-step -step instruction on how to log into YouTube, on to get exactly on the video as well as going to Ascension Press and registering so you can have access to the actual No Gritter Love video. There. Very good. Okay, so you will have the, the, the outline, you will have the questions for, for sessions four and five, and in case you didn't get it, I'll also give uh, last time, I'll also give the the outline and questions to session three so that when she sends it to you, you can have that as well. If you want to pick them up here at the office, unless they shut us down completely and quarantine us in our homes, then you can pick it up here at the office and I will have those available for you as well. So, Ada will have sent that link to you and give you instructions about how to get to the Ascension Press website to see the video so at this point we're going to see the video so put me on pause and go to the video and when the video is through you can come back and we'll have the explanation of the video thank you okay we're back hope you enjoyed the video um, Session three, the trial before Pilate, Jesus is condemned to death. This is chapters 10, 11, and 12. And since I don't have you here in front of me, uh, I'm going to go through the outline. I don't usually cover the entire outline, but I'm going to cover it just briefly and then talk at length uh, in greater detail about some of the, uh, and highlight some of the outline. So, um, let's begin with number one. Jesus is led before Pilate, the Roman governor of Judea. So, why go to the Roman authorities if the Jewish authorities have already decided that Jesus is guilty? Why did the Jews have to go to the Romans? I mean, they, they've decided Jesus is guilty, let's put him to death. Well, it's because the Jews weren't allowed to put anyone to death. That's a civil uh, duty. That's the, the Roman government could do that, but not the Jews. 
Remember, the Jews are subjugated to the Romans. So they had to go to the Roman authorities to have a capital punishment. All right. Then he is led bound, and a large number of the Jewish Sanhedrin, the, the Jewish leaders, bring Jesus to, to Pilate, and uh, they accuse him. And the reason there's such a large number and there's, there's such a crowd, they want to make sure that the Roman authorities think that Jesus is dangerous, that he's a criminal, that he has to be put to death. All right? And so they begin to accuse him to Pilate and say he's, he's guilty of perverting our nation. In other words, uh, of leading them away from their loyalty to Rome that he's guilty of forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar to pay taxes. And of course, that's a blatant lie. Jesus didn't say not to pay taxes. What did he say? Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Give to God what is God's. He didn't forbid them to pay taxes. He told them, give the, give the taxes to Caesar. The coins belong to Caesar. And they say that Jesus said he is a king. He's, he's the Christ, a king. And of course, this would pose a problem. In other words, they, he would be saying that he was a king and could be uh, someone that would be there to overthrow Roman rule. And of course, this would be a big problem for Pilate. But notice that Pilate sees through this whole charade. He sees that this is really about the Jewish leaders being jealous of Jesus because Jesus had a great following of the people. Matthew 27, 18 says, It was out of envy that they delivered him up. So Pilate was used to dealing with these revolutionaries. Someone actually like Judas, who was a, a revolutionary. And then Jesus took in, remember, uh, Judas was a zealot. And so he's used to seeing these revolutionaries. He realizes Jesus is not one of these people. So it has to be out of jealousy. That the, Roman, that the Jewish leaders are bringing, them, uh, bringing him before Pilate. Pilate has to be careful, though, because this, this idea that Jesus could be a king, a rival leader, that could be a big problem for Rome, which means a big problem for Pilate. So what does he say? The very next question after this, he turns to Jesus and he says, So, are you the king of the Jews? He wants to know, are you really a king? And what does Jesus say? You have said so. So it's kind of a, qualit a qualitative or a qualified affirmative. He's saying, yes, but not the way you think. All right? What does he, he tells Pilate? My kingship is not of this world. So Pilate says, I find no crime in him. There's, there's nothing he's guilty of. Nothing that's not uh, a, a Jewish or religious problem. He's not concerned about the religious problems. He's only concerned about civil problems. He sees no problem with Jesus. He's not a revolutionary. He's not a criminal. If there's some kind of a dispute that's a religious dispute, he tells the Jews, you handle it. I don't, that's not concerning me. But when Pilate hears that Jesus is a Galilean, he's from Galilee, so he sends him to Herod, who happens to be in the area, in the city, at that time. Remember, this is Passover. And so you have lots of people in Jerusalem at this time. And so he sends him to, uh, to Herod so he can deal with him. Be done with it. So who was Herod? He was known as Herod Antipas. He was a tetrarch or a ruler of that part of his father's, Herod the Great's, kingdom. And so uh, Herod Antipas was a rule over actually one-fourth of Herod the Great's kingdom. Now, he's the same Herod who had John the Baptist killed. So that will give you an idea of where we are. So Jesus goes before Herod and Herod had been hearing about Jesus, and he actually, it says he longed to see Jesus. He wanted to, he's heard all about this guy who, who uh, performs all these miracles, these great signs. And so what does he do? He asks Jesus, uh, do something for me. He wants him to perform. 
So he wants, he wants to see a sign. He wants to see a miracle. And as your book says, or, or your paper says, unlike Mary, who it says, kept all these things, pondering them in her heart, Herod does not approach Jesus humbly. He mocks him and just wants Jesus to perform like a performer, like a juggler. And what does Jesus do? He remains silent. He doesn't answer Herod. So Herod says, well, heck with this. Be done with it. So he sends him back to Pilate. Okay. So, again, the Jewish leaders confront Pilate and they say, if you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. So here the Jewish leaders kind of pin Pilate in a corner. Pilate knows that Jesus is innocent. And yet, if it gets back to Caesar, that Pilate releases him, and uh, he could be problems, then that could be big problems for Pilate. He could be put to death. Right? So Pilate chooses his own self-interest over truth. What does he say? What is truth? See, the truth is not an abstract concept. It's a person. It's Jesus. To reject the truth is to re reject Jesus. What does Jesus say? I am the way and the truth and the life. See, many of our problems in today's culture stem from this problem that each person, each one, can have their own truth. That there isn't objective truth. You have your truth and I have my truth. Hey, it's Ada. I am going to make a video on how to log into Ascension Press so that you can watch the videos for No Greater Love Bible Study. You're going to go ahead and go to your email, and in your email, you are going to receive this photo with this link. In order to click the link, you see it says click. So you're going to go ahead and push control. You're going to push control and click. It is going to open up a new window for you. And in this window, it's going to take you exactly to where you need to be. StudyAscensionPress.com invite. And this is where you're going to redeem the code that we have in the email for you. You'll fill it out. Registration code, email, first name, last name, and if you're over the age of 13, redeem code. From there, you'll have access to all videos for No Greater Love's Bible Study. And if there's no absolute right or wrong, then even the most wicked sins are not wrong, and no one can judge me. That's called moral relativism. And it's why we have people who actually think it's okay to kill babies, or even after they're born, or sell their body parts. We actually have people who are openly celebrating their abortions. And if you haven't seen that, it's pretty sick. You have these great big rallies and you'll have these stars who are getting up in front of the crowds and, and saying, isn't it great I had an abortion? Oh my gosh, you're celebrating killing your kids. It's why there are people who see no problem with homosexual marriage or fetal stem cell research even when they have to kill babies to get the stem cells. And that's why God gave us the magisterium, the church's magisterium, the Pope in conjunction with the bishops who have the authority that Jesus gave them starting with the apostles to make authoritative decisions. All right? So, it's to help us to understand the moral issues we face and to know for certain how we should live according to the church's teachings. Jesus guaranteed that the Holy Spirit would always protect the church from teaching error. He didn't say that the church would always, uh, that the entire church membership would always be holy. That's obviously not the case. 
It wasn't even the case for the twelve apostles. But he guaranteed that the church would always teach the truth. Jesus said, I will send my advocate, the Holy Spirit, and he will guide you into all truth. And he will be with you until the end of time. He also told, told the apostles, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. In other words, since we know nothing impure can enter heaven, it has to be true. And so whatever the apostles, and then later as they lay hands on other men, and so forth and so on down to today, the church would always have to teach truth that the Holy Spirit would guarantee that. And then Paul backs that up later by saying, the church is the pillar and foundation of truth. In other words, that's where you go to get the absolute truth. Through Jesus' church, we can know for certain what is truth and how we can be faithful to His Word. Number four, Barabbas or Jesus. So Pilate, Pilate there is a tradition in the Roman rule that says once a year, at this time of the Passover, they would bring out two prisoners and they would release one as a show of good faith, I guess, to the Jewish people. And so he brings out this murderer, Barabbas, who had been part of an insurrection and had murdered people. And then he brings out Jesus. And he says, who do you want me to release to you? Barabbas or Jesus? And of course, they had gotten the, some of the people, they had bribed some of the people, and some of the Jews, the Jewish leadership had bribed, and they're yelling, give us Barabbas. Now, it's really interesting because the word Barabbas in Aramaic, Bar Abbas, means son of the father. So in the Old Testament, God calls Israel my firstborn son. Exodus 4.22. And Jesus calls himself God's son. So Jesus is a bar Abbas, a son of the Father. Israel is a son of the Father. All right. So here we have this play on words. So which one is the true Israelite? Is it Barabbas or Jesus? Which one is the true son of the Father? Is it Barabbas? Or is it Jesus? Which one caused the Romans to, uh, with them, insurrection and murder? And which one is saying to love and forgive your enemies? See, it's Jesus is the true Son of the Father, the true Israelite. Number five, Jesus is scourged. John 19, 1. See, in Jewish law, lashes to be to be uh, beaten with a whip. The lashes were limited to forty. Oh, same thing. Uh, okay. How far do you know? We'll have to Just when you. Okay. Let me let me go get. Uh, okay. Go get. Go to your flash drive. How yeah. can you do that? Oh. Yeah, just use your flash drive instead of your phone. Your, huh? Can your flash drive go into your uh, camera? Uh, I don't understand what It's not the camera, he's using the phone. The I'm using just I know, but could you use the camera? Does yes. that have more memory? Probably so, yeah. Then I would use the camera. Just use the camera. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can you do that and be able to load it? Yes. Yeah, because uh -huh. that's what I uh -huh. first originally. Flash yeah, could, the, is your flash able to plug into your camera okay number five Jesus is scourged John 19 1 in Jewish law if someone was scourged if they were whipped they limited it to 40 lashes that's in Deuteronomy 25 3 
page 111 in your book. But that wasn't true of Roman law. Roman law, remember the Romans were brutal. They were savage. So there was no limit to how many lashes someone could get. The idea was to beat them so severely they could even die. All right, so Jesus faced a Roman scourging, which meant it was meant to maim or kill the person. That's why he only lasted six hours on the cross when most people lasted days. He was almost dead from the scourging before he was ever nailed to the cross. Number six, the crowning with thorns, John 19, 2. The soldiers mockingly kneel before Jesus. The, the ir irony is that all creation will bow before Jesus at the end of time. Number seven, Pilate brings Jesus back to the crowd. Now the reason he had Jesus scourged in the first place, he's hoping to satisfy the crowd so he doesn't have to crucify Jesus. He thinks, well, if I have him scourged, then that will satisfy them. So when he brings Jesus before the crowd this time, Jesus has been so severely beaten, he shows Jesus to the crowd and he has, if you've seen the Passion of the Christ, it was probably a pretty accurate portrayal of what Jesus looked like. There were whip marks and, and slashes all over his body. And the Roman whips were used uh, with a handle and long pieces of leather and pieces of metal or bone that were very sharp at the end of the pieces of leather. And so they would dig into the skin down to the bone and, and leaving the flesh just hanging from the body. And so when he shows Jesus, He's so badly beaten and, and, and slashed that Scripture says, this is Isaiah 52, 14, it says he was so badly beaten that he was hardly recognizable as human. Little does Pilate realize that he unwittingly uses the language from the Jewish Scriptures that Jesus is the long-awaited Messiah this is Zechariah 6, 12 and 13, and it says, Behold the man, in reference to the future king, the son of David, who shall bear royal honor and shall sit and rule upon his throne. And so when he brings Jesus before the crowd, he says, Behold the man. And he doesn't realize it, but he's repeating the words from the prophet Zechariah. Jesus is the son of man, also from Daniel's vision, Daniel 7, 13 and 14. Pilate's words allude to Jesus being the Son of Man in the prophecy in, from the prophet Daniel. Remember in the last session where we read from Daniel 7 about how Jesus fulfilled the prophecy by Daniel about being the Son of Man who was to come, whom God would give everlasting kingship and dominion over all nations. Others like St. Paul see this scripture as a reference to Jesus as the new Adam. 1 Corinthians 15, 45. So, Jesus is the Son of Man. Jesus is the new Adam. And Jesus is the King of the Jews. Number eight, the Jewish leaders, uh, Pilate says, so is this your king? And when they say, you're not Caesar's friend, they're accusing Pilate that he's going to give, a, he's going to give Rome a problem. He's going to give Caesar a problem. The problem here is Israel was forbidden from making a foreign ruler, any foreigner, their king. But when Pilate says, is this your king? They said, no, we have no king but Caesar. 
God alone is king. Judges 8.23 and 1 Samuel 8, 4-20 make it clear. When Pilate asked, shall I crucify your king? The chief prince, the chief priests answer, we have no king but Caesar. Remember that in the Old Testament, that God was supposed to be their only king. And when the Israelites saw other nations that they had kings, they wanted one too. So God appointed a king over them, but from their own kinsmen. And that was Saul. Later, when David became king, he was meant to be a foretelling of the future Messiah that would come to rule the Israelites as God's anointed one. Messiah means anointed one, the anointed one of God. That's why Jesus was called the son of David. The Jewish leaders reaffirm this belief in God as their only king in a prayer they recite every day. And it says, may you be our king and you alone. And in the song they sang during the Passover, remember this is the time of the Passover. So it's not like it's in a distant memory. This is something the Jews had sung during the Passover. And it says, From everlasting to everlasting you are God. Beside you we have no king, redeemer, or savior, no liberator, deliverer, provider, none who takes pity in time of distress and trouble. We have no king but you. Now they were completely turning their backs on God and declaring that Caesar was their only king. It would be like us saying the Lord's Prayer every day, our Father, and then turning to some savage dictator and saying, no, you're our only Father. After waiting for centuries for God to come as their Savior, their Messiah, these Jewish high priests who were supposed to be the religious leaders, who were supposed to know better than any other Jew, who knew the Scriptures better than anyone else, they choose for their king, not the Messiah, not Jesus, not the true son of David, but the emperor Caesar. And lastly, Pilate says, what can I do? And he washes his hands of the whole thing as a display that it's not on me. But of course, that's how we remember. We remember Caesar as having Jesus crucified. So that's our outline. I want to go through the, um, the questions with you just briefly. Hopefully you have the questions with you. Ada is sending them to you uh, online, or if you want to pick them up here at the office, we'll have a copy available to you as long as we are still allowed to be here. Uh, and I'll, I'll have all three, three, four, and fifth sessions available. And you'll continue to be able to get the videos from Ascension Press. But let's go to uh, the questions. From chapter 10, because Pilate does not believe in objective truth, he does not have a moral standard outside of himself to guide him. He's left with only his own truth the need to protect his own reputation and career. So he sends an innocent man off to be crucified. The question is, what are, to, what are some of the relative, what are some of the ways relativism leads to innocent people being hurt in our own culture today? When there is no objective right or wrong, what in today's culture causes trouble or problems or uh, people to be hurt because of it. Chapter 11, following Jesus' teaching and example, what are some of the most important things we should do to extend Christ's kingdom in our workplace, in our parish, or ministry, or in our families? Chapter 12, Pilate was a coward on Good Friday. He was afraid of what people would say about him, so he sent Jesus to be crucified. In what ways might Christians be afraid of what others think of them today? 
How might that fear hinder them from living their faith more fully? And how might it keep them from standing up for their faith? These are all good questions that require a lot of thought, maybe prayer. And I hope these are questions that will help you in your faith. We'll, uh, we'll see you again next Thursday evening. Again, same time and place. And uh, God bless you. If you have any problems, if you have any questions, please call. Uh, if you have any needs aside from the study, please call the parish office. The priests are still available uh, on an appointment basis only for confessions. And uh, keep reading scripture. Keep praying the rosary. Keep tuning in to the Mass we're having on Facebook, live streaming every morning at 8.30 and on the weekend as well. Uh, and um, tune in to Facebook, tune, turn in to YouTube, and um, God bless you. Let's finish with a prayer in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. God bless you.